time to pick back up with part two with our interview with the PA football historian as we talk about the great rivalries of Shamoke and Mount Carmel, Bellwood Andes, Tyrone, Germantown Academy, Penn Charter, and Bishop McDevitt in Harrisburg. Three great rivalries and more from the PA football historian coming up in just a moment. This is the Pigskin Daily History Dispatch, a podcast that covers the anniversaries of American football events throughout history on a day-to-day basis. Your host, Darren Hayes, is podcasting from America's North Shore to bring you the memories of the gridiron one day at a time. So as we come out of the tunnel of the Sports History Network, let's take the field and go no huddle through the portal of positive gridiron history with pigskindispatch.com. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of pigskindispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal to positive football history. And we left off a couple days ago. We started part one of a great conversation we had with the great expert historian of high school football on PAFBhistory.com and talking about these great rivalries from the state that I live in, the uh, state of Pennsylvania. And it's just uh, some tremendous rivalries that we got to talk about so far. We only talked about two so far, and we have some more conversations conversations coming up here from that interview that we had with him and we're going to continue that on uh, and cover uh, four more of these great rivalries from Pennsylvania that I think you're going to enjoy because there are some great athletes that have come out of these and these rivalries are long-standing and very uh, famous especially in the towns that they're near so uh, we'll continue that right now with our PA football historian. So moving on we talked about streaks earlier um, this is what I was alluding to. So anybody in the coal region probably got this right. Um, it's Shemokin and Mount Carmel. So they've played every year since 1934. They've played 114 times overall. Mount Carmel's won 25 straight games in this rivalry. And I think that somebody might be thinking, how can you call this one of the best rivalries in the state if one team's won every game since 1996? Shemokin hasn't won since 95. Um, you know, I think it combines uh, two things. It combines the, just the history of it. Um, you know, you're talking about Mount Carmel, the winningest team in Pennsylvania history. Shemokin has over 600 wins. They're in the top 50. Um, so obviously tons and tons of history between the two teams. Not ju- it's not just Mount Carmel and then somebody else. It's Mount Carmel and, and Shemokin, another historically great program. Um, but you also have kind of the aura of this being a coal region game and people who aren't familiar with Pennsylvania um, coal region is in kind of the dividing line of central and eastern Pennsylvania I would call it eastern Pennsylvania some people might differ with me on that um, the the hotbed of anthracite mining for well over 100 years you have a lot of small towns um, like Shemokin, and like Mount Carmel and you can go down the list and name all the other ones um, lots of really tough people have come out of those towns and tough football teams and really good football teams forever. Um, you know, I, I think you could probably make the argument that uh, the, the three historical hotbeds of, and I'm going to ruffle feathers with this, uh, not intentionally, <laughs> um, but the three historical hotbeds of high school football in Pennsylvania, the two are somewhat obvious. You're talking Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, and I think the goal region is number three, because when you're talking about the quality of programs and the amount of guys you go back and you look at an NFL roster from the forties or fifties, you're going to you pick any NFL team. You can almost guarantee that you're going to find at least one guy on that roster from a four H high school. And, and, you know, it's kind of a forgotten um, from a national perspective. A lot of people don't know that area now, but deep, deeply steeped in history. Um, this game actually used to be a Thanksgiving day game. Um, but isn't anymore. Um, two teams, they play for the coal bucket, which is perfectly fitting if you know that area. Um, mm-hmm. Can't drive through that area without seeing, you know, slag heaps and everything else along the side of the road. So it fits perfectly. And in a region with a lot of pretty heated rivalries, um, you know, I think Shemokin and Mount Carmel might be, might take the cake for the, the most heated, the most passionate. So I think, I thought it was a good one to include despite you know, the lopsided nature of it recently and historically, thanks to that 25 uh, year run, Mount Carmel's, uh, they, they lead all time 78, 25 and 11. So really uneven, but again, there are a lot of games in that history. If you go back through, 
that are one score games, single digit score games. So, um, you know, don't, don't rely too much on the, on the series record to understand the importance of this one. Well, that you, it's funny that you say that because uh, later this week, and I'll probably be airing it next week, uh, I'm going to be talking to historian Joe Zagorski, who's from north of Philly. We're going to be talking about the Anthracite League of the, mm-hmm. you know, the 20s and 30s, you know, the Pottsville Maroons and some of the, the semi-pro teams there and some of the great stars that came out of that. And you're right, there is a, a plethora of people that uh, came out in early pro football uh, that were from that Anthracite League in the coal regions and uh, just some tremendous players and some of them you know most people have never heard of but they were just outstanding so and then there are guys like like fritz pollard um played there you know fritz pollard anybody who studied the early nfl knows that name knows who fritz pollard was he, he and, coached in that area too yeah he he played and coached at i believe gilberton and if you look up gilberton on a map and you realize that they at one time had a professional football team like gilberton's this big and you know you brought up the maroons and i'm I'm going to go back in time someday and, and I'm going to stump hard for that, that 1925 NFL title that was wrongfully stolen from the Pottsville Maroons. Pottsville, Pottsville, Pennsylvania is the home of an NFL championship team. And I will not be convinced otherwise. And I'll get off my soapbox on that, but um, I, I feel strongly about that one. So. Well, we will we'll have to have a discussion on that because I have a, a, another gentleman that I, that's a friend of mine that works for NFL films that argues the other way. And he's from, he lives in that area mm-hmm. and he argues against it. So, but we'll, the type discussion for another day, we're talking about high right. school football. We won't we'll steal the spotlight from them today. Right. Right. Yeah. The next one I have. Um, so number four on the list uh, is uh, one that was uh, submitted multiple times. Um, and I was glad that it did. I wanted to add this to the list. Um, this is one that, um, probably, uh, based on where I grew up is the one I was, I grew up most familiar with. It wasn't a part of it or anything, but I was most familiar with it. And that's, uh, Bellwood, Annis and Tyrone. Um, both teams are, are just North of Altoona. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the geographic, they're both smaller schools, but tremendous, tremendous football history, especially in the last 40 years or so, 30, 40 years, um, it's called the Backyard Brawl, so they stole that nickname from West Virginia and Pitt, but this game's actually still played, and it, uh, it's, it's very, very intense. It, they open up with each other. That's a week one game, or I guess now we call it week zero, and I'm, I'm kind of anti-week zero terminology. I don't like that, but <laughs> it's, it's a week zero game now, um, and it's, it's a little bit unusual for that, for that uh, reason. You know, A lot of times you're looking at rivalry games midseason or week 10, end of the season, they open up with each other and Tyrone leads this series 55, 31 and one, but Bellwood's won the last three straight. Bellwood's a, a slightly smaller school than Tyrone is. They border each other. The schools are like seven miles apart and that's it. Um, this for my money is <clears throat> probably without question, the biggest rivalry in district six and district six is the, is a massive um, district geographically. So you're covering a good chunk of the state by saying that. And I think, Central Pennsylvania, and by that I mean basically Pittsburgh to Harrisburg, that area in between. I think this is the biggest rivalry in that whole chunk of the state. Um, it's incredibly heated. It's always close. No matter, no, it, it's one of those rivalries because it's week one. There are oftentimes, you know, people who think that, oh, this is Tyrone's year. Tyrone's going to be a force this year, and most years they are. And now Bellwood's going to be awesome, Bell, and most years they are. But it seems like one of those games that every year you can just make a prediction and you're always going to be wrong. And um, so I, I think that week one factor of it, the fact that you're geographically close 55, 31 and one is, is not, you know, neck and neck necessarily, but considering Tyrone's the bigger school, Bellwood's been right in there a lot of years. And I think that uh, one of the more unique things that kind of sets this rivalry apart is who, who these teams have been coached by. Um, you know, for a long stretch of this rivalry, it was kind of defined by the coaches. Tyrone's still led by John Franco. Um, John Franco took them to the 1999 uh, 2A title. Tyrone won it. They beat Mount Carmel in that game, actually. Um, and that was kind of a, a shock of cold water, I think, across the state because teams from District 6 weren't supposed to win. Teams from the middle of Pennsylvania weren't supposed to win state titles. And in recent years, Bishop Guilfoyle won a few straight. Um, so District 6 now has four titles, I think, as a district. Um, but for about 15 years, Tyrone was the only school from District 6 to win one. And um, so John Franco's legendary across the state. 
And then Bellwood was led for, for years by John Hayes. So Franco had 264 career wins. He's still active, so he's going to continue to add to that. And John Hayes retired several years back, but he won 323 games. So he kind of had a cool, you know, when I was thinking about this game, uh, it, it almost made me think of like a Bo Schembeck or Woody, Woody Hayes kind of thing. Like you had two Titans on, on the sideline for years and years um, throughout this rivalry. And, and you don't get that all the time in high school. So I thought that was pretty cool about this game. Yeah, I, I can remember, it wasn't too many years ago, we had a, a pretty good uh, team from up here in District 10 that we thought was going to go pretty far, you know, to, to get to follow them a little bit. And they met up with Tyrone in inner districts, and Tyrone was like a buzzsaw and just destroy them. You know, we're like, oh, my God, you know, this team has got to be pretty good if they beat. Because our, our team, we had some pretty good kids on this team, too, and they, they tore them apart. It was like a 40-point game. I'm like, wow. So most- we're, we're familiar with Tyrone up here. Yeah, most years this game goes pretty quick because Tyrone has had years where they've opened it up a little bit, but but both of these teams love nothing more than running about five to six different plays and running the ball 80, 80 90% of the time. So this sometimes the, the backyard brawl seems like it lasts about an hour and a half. Um, they, they get through games pretty quick because they love to run the ball, but just physical, tough kids. Um, you know, Blair County rivalry, it's just a cool thing. And I don't think it gets um, kind of the respect uh, statewide um, that it should, but it's, it's a big, big deal. And, and like I said, kicking off week one of the season is a pretty cool thing about it too. Well, that, that sounds like a great one. I'm not familiar with Bellwood. I'll have to do some studying up on them a little bit, especially if they have three wins against Tyrone. Yeah. they beat three, three, Last year was 33, 13, I believe. So wow. Uh, and Bellwood's just been, you know, they're a small school kind of machine that, you know, you have those small schools that they never seem to hit the the ebbs and flows that other schools do. They just continue to put out good teams. And and even after Hayes left, you know, they, they've continued to be solid and, and really strong. So it's a great, great small school program. They've never made it to Hershey. Um, although I got to update that, that, that terminology. Now I got to, they never made it to Hershey or Cumberland Valley. Now I got to change that because we changed where our state title games are, but um, they've, they've made state semis. They've made a lot of state quarters. Um, they've, they've had many, many deep runs in the States. They've just never gotten the whole way to the top yet. Um, well, so we're going to get, we're going to get back on that topic where the state final should be too at the end here too. Cause <laughs> sure. yeah, I, I have some things to say about that, I guess. Um, <laughs> next game, uh, very, very different. Um, especially when talking about, a, a Tyrone Bellwood, um, is Germantown Academy and Penn Charter School. So very different than a lot of the other games that I've been talking about so far. First of all, both of these schools are, are private schools. They're prep schools. Um, both schools are, are not in the PIAA. Um, they're independent schools. They play in the interacademic league. Um, so, you know, they're playing against Haverford School and, and, and other Mercersburg Academy, those kind of schools in Pennsylvania, and then also out-of-state schools, um, you know, mostly in New Jersey. Um, this is uh, considered the longest continually played rivalry among Pennsylvania schools. And it's the longest one um, between prep schools nationally. So in, in all of America, it's the longest one between the longest continual rivalry between two prep schools. Um, they first played in 1887. And I'm going off the top of my head on this, but uh, for reference, I think that was the first year Penn State fielded a football team. And I believe that's the year the Pittsburgh Pirates became the Pirates. So, but, um, but more more perspective, Walter Camp changed the rules of rugby into what what we recognize as football. Eighteen eighty, he added right. scrimmage. You know, so it's only seven years after that. So that's we are in, that's real early. Yeah, we are in like the fossil history, the fossil record of football going back that far. I've actually the stocking cap era of football. Yes, <laughs> yeah, I was looking um, just to find some some you know, numbers, make sure all my stuff was right. Uh, earlier today, I was just doing some fact checking and I found a, a pretty cool article. It's about 10 years old from uh, Penn Charters alumni magazine, I think it was. And it had a picture and, you know, it, it was there. The guys were sitting there with a big old watermelon football, um, you know, massive. And people were like, why didn't they throw the ball until later? Well, you couldn't have done that. Thing. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely very, very old. The Interact has couple really old rivalries. Um, the Hill School, which is another suburban Philly school, um, Germantown Academy and Penn Charter, both in the Philadelphia area. Um, Hill School is another school down that way. They've been playing Lawrenceville, which is out of New Jersey. They started playing in 1887 as well. 
Um, and then Haverford School and Episcopal Academy started playing in 1889. So the Interact is is full of old rivalries like the, this, predominantly because the schools are very old and those kind of independent schools have tended to uh, stick around longer than other schools that might have merged and consolidated with other nearby public schools. Um, Another lopsided one, I promise we have closer ones coming up, but this is another lopsided rivalry. Um, Penn Charter leads this one, and they've, this number is so huge, it, it sounds crazy, but they've just been playing so long. Um, Penn Charter has won 87 games in the series. Um, then Germantown's won 37, and they've tied 11 times. So not, not close in that regard. It's been closer lately, though. Um, Penn Charter won a lot of games early on and, and they've continued to be successful, but this game's a little bit more competitive um, in the past decade or so than it was for a long time before that. And just a lot of things about this game that I think the average fan of, of you know, just, just a regular public school, you know, you kind of get those different for that different flavor when you're talking about a, uh, um, a pair of schools like this, private schools where they play every year on a specific day, and I'm not going to na name it. I'm going to name it both ways because if you're a Penn Charter fan, it's PCGA Day, but Germantown Academy fans call it GAPC Day because they need to make sure your school goes first. Um, <laughs> and it's not just a football game. They do lots of athletic competitions, academic competitions um, between the two schools throughout the day, and the football game is kind of the centerpiece of that. Um, so pretty cool, extremely old um, game MVP gets what's called the Geist Trophy, which is named after a Germantown graduate who was killed in Korea. Um, so lots of cool little uh, flair to this game. Um, in, in addition to the fact that it's very old and has two, you know, really prestigious schools at the center of it. Yeah, I, I guess, I mean, I know you talked uh, recently with our friend Arnie Chapman on the Football History Dude podcast. And you know, for those that are not from Pennsylvania, you have to realize that the Philadelphia schools, especially these big schools, uh, weren't part of the PIAA until probably, what, 15 years ago, maybe? They, yeah, it was, about, it was about 07, 08. Yeah, so this is sort of a, a new tradition of even any of the Philadelphia schools participating in the state playoffs. They had their own playoffs, which were, you know, I'm sure tremendous. You know, I've heard stories about how these things and these these there's schools, and I, I think these are two of them that are they're like the sizes of uh, you know uh, Division two universities. You know, the amount of students they have at them, they're they're big. Yeah, so. and, you know, again, we can go through names of all these robberies, but Penn Charter's got you know a guy with a lot of name recognition right now, Matt, Matt Ryan went there. Um, and Mike McGlinchey, who's an offensive lineman in the NFL, and is Mike, Matt Ryan's cousin, I believe. Um, they both went to Penn Charter. But yeah, the Interact's kind of a, a different animal because yeah, the, the, they're the only, that only small cluster of teams in the state really that's not part of the PIAA anymore. There are a handful of teams, and by handful, I mean, I think four or five, trying to play eight man right now. Um, so they're not officially, I think the schools are still members of the PIAA, but eight man football is not sanctioned by the PIAA at this point. Um, but for the most part, these interact schools are really the only schools that aren't part of the PIAA. So they've kind of ex existed. I think if you're not in that, that Philadelphia area or around Mercersburg, Mercersburg is a little bit of an outlier. Um, and then in the West, Kiskey Prep is kind of in that boat as well but there's not a lot of schools um, outside of the Philadelphia area that fit in that category. So I think that for a lot of fans across the state, it, a lot of the interact stuff almost seems to happen behind a curtain. Like you don't really know it's there until you go dig for it and find it. It's not always right front and center um, unless you're right in that immediate um, geographic area. If you're in Philadelphia, you're probably seeing it in the Inquirer and everything else. And Ted Sillery's website, which is one of the best, um, I would call it the best, high school football um, websites on the internet. Um, lots and lots of stuff on the internet on there. But, um, you know, if, if you're somebody who lives in in Harrisburg or Scranton or, or Newcastle, you probably don't know a lot about the Interact um, just because it's it's kind of off the beaten path, off the map a little bit. So I wanted to highlight that um, it's age and everything that kind of goes around it. Um, it's kind of how how really in the, in the dawn of high school football, those are the schools that we're playing. Um, they were, they were private schools, prep schools, um, you know, in some cases, boarding schools or military schools. So, um, you know, I, I thought this was a good fit for the list. Now, now were this, was it in football where they, whoever would win the, the Philadelphia Interact, would they play like the teams from New York City, the champion? Or was that just in basketball they did that? I, I know there was that. one sport. 
Yeah, I think they did that in basketball. I'm not familiar with that coming across in uh, in football or not, or maybe I haven't come across it. That might be a great opportunity for somebody to point me in the right direction on that. Um, so that sounds awesome. Uh, I, yeah, I might be mistaken on it. Maybe I'm getting yeah. basketball confused. But when you started saying that, I'm thinking, yeah, the thing I knew they had a championship game, but it wasn't just they were playing a different city, and I thought it was New York City. There's there's a lot of the interact. You know, those schools have a lot of crossover with, like I said, like New Jersey schools. So like like I mentioned, Lawrenceville, Petty School, Pennington, uh, Hun School, I think, uh, Princeton's prep school. So um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of crossover out of state there. Um, but yeah, yeah, it, it, I thought it was a pretty neat thing. And, and I learned some things researching that one for sure. Um, so we go from the oldest one to the oldest rivalry in the state. Um, to what is the newest rivalry on my list. Um, two teams that have only played 36 times all time, and they actually haven't played for a couple of years. Um, they haven't played since 2017, but I think that uh, I would be uh, slaughtered online if I didn't include this one. Um, it's Harrisburg and Bishop McDevitt. Um, you know, just hearing the name, I think people can understand part of the draw of this game. You have Harrisburg, one of the, you know, 10 biggest cities in the state against that, that city's Catholic school. And, you know, there's naturally going to be a little bit of that, that, you know, private public kind of intensity that always comes. You can't avoid it. So you might as well mention a little bit. Um, but I think one of the coolest things about this series is first of all, it's tied all time. It's 1818. Um, so neither team has the upper hand and you can't get any more balance than that. That's for sure. Uh, no, they've never even tied. So, I mean, it's one team one year, one team the other year. And um, before Bishop McDevitt several years ago built a new school that was a little bit further removed from downtown. But before they did that, for the first probably at least 30 games of this series, um, they always played this game on Saturday morning. And the, the bands and the players would literally just walk down the street because the schools were only two blocks away. So they, the bands and the team would just walk down the street to the other school and they play on a Saturday morning, which I think is one of those things you only get in high school football. You know, it's just, just a really, yeah, cool. really, really interesting thing that you only get, I think, at, at that level of football. Um, and they've only, they've only played since 1982. Harrisburg was formed in 1971, but they didn't play for over a decade um, after that. Um, but prior to that, Bishop McDevitt had played the two forerunners um, to Harrisburg. And I talked about these teams a little bit um, in my interview with Arnie, but um, one was John Harris and one was William Penn. And those two schools closed at the end of 1970 and became Harrisburg High. Uh, McDevitt didn't have a lot of success against either of those teams. Um, but to be fair, uh, McDevitt's heyday really didn't start until, you know, arguably the 80s. Um, but they went 122 and two against John Harris and 729 and six against William Penn. So I think that that's probably why they didn't play Harrisburg high for a while, thinking these two teams that, you know, we have, haven't had a lot of success against, they combined. And now we probably want to give it some time before we start playing that team. Um, but I, I think there's only a couple games in the state that can kind of match this game when you're talking about name recognition. Um, and another one is going to be two, two games from this, but, um, you know, when you're just going back 30 years, you know, Harrisburg and McDevitt, you're talking about Ricky Waters, LaShawn McCoy, Michael Parsons, Noah Spence, who, you know, played in the NFL, probably didn't have the career everybody thought he might, but was one of the most highly recruited guys out of Pennsylvania in a 15 year period. Um, Rakai Nelson played at Notre Dame in the nineties, Cameron Artis Payne has played in the NFL. So you have a lot of guys, and those are just recent guys, you know, most of those guys have played since 2000. And so you have a lot of talent. You have a lot of um, proximity involved in this one. The series is tied 18-18. You got the cool thing about walking down the street to play the game on a Saturday morning. Uh, Bishop McDevitt's old field was called the Rock Pile. The nickname of it was the Rock Pile. So just think about two teams walking down the street to play at the Rock Pile is a pretty cool thing. So, you know, if you read that in a book, you'd think the book was garbage. But if it's real life, it's awesome. So that's what I like about that one. Um, so Harrisburg McDevitt's definitely – definitely a, a passionate one and, and had to be on the list, even though it's only 36 games long. 
All right, it's that time where we're going to pause this conversation again because we're breaking this up into another couple parts here. Is we have four more great rivalries we're going to talk about with a PA football history historian uh, from his great website, PAFBHistory.com. And uh, we'll get some more of that in our next episode, just two days from now, where we'll talk about some more of these great Pennsylvania high school rivalries. So stay tuned. And until tomorrow, everybody, have a great gridiron day. That's all the football history we have today, folks. Join us back tomorrow for more of your football history. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleet Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? you should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, Check out the 1963 Vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order.